I've got a very Scottish first name, being Duncan, but uh, my surname is, I pronounce it as Stang, but uh, the, I think the more correct pronunciation is Stang. Um, and in uh, searching in a bit of my history, uh, I knew my grandfather was Norwegian, Enoch Stang, and uh, he came across to Scotland uh, many years ago. But this is actually my great, great grandfather, Frederick Stang, who was the first Prime Minister of Norway. So I have a close affinity to all the people from Norway here. I'm a podiatrist. I have a twin role. For 25 years, I have worked with the diabetic foot, working in multidisciplinary foot ulcer clinics, and involved in various aspects of screening the diabetic foot um, through, through managing the different stages. And I, half of my role now is working with the ulcerated diabetic foot as part of a multidisciplinary foot clinic in a hospital. The other 50% of my role is to help organise the services and promote good practice throughout Scotland as an initiative from the Scottish Government. So I have 50% of my role with the Scottish Government to improve food services throughout Scotland and 50% actually with my gloves on in the clinic. So I come from both sides. So as we know, diabetes is turning into an epidemic throughout the world. And they reckon by 2030, we'll be up to about 438 million. And in speaking to various people here in the reception last night, it's, it's not just in the UK and not just in the underdeveloped countries around the world that diabetes is becoming an epidemic, which it is. Uh, it is rising in developed countries uh, at an astonishing rate, especially as we know type 2. So it can really be described as an epidemic. So a wee bit of research, diabetes in Norway, you have around 140,000 people who are taking medicines for diabetes in Norway today. And the Norwegian Associate, uh, Diabetes Association estimates that about 25,000 people live with type 1. And that indicates that you've got about 114,000 who have type 2 diabetes who are on medication. Now, what does it mean that are on medication? That probably just means those are the people who know they have the condition. As we know, there's a lot of people out there who will be suffering from diabetes who don't know it. And I'm not sure the exact statistics, but in the UK, on diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, around 50% of the patients already have some of the complications because they've been living with the condition for a long amount uh, for a great amount of years so we have to be very very careful with this group of patients who don't yet know they have the condition and are not being treated for it they estimate that the prevalence in norway is about 4.7 percent in 2007 and it's projected to rise to 5.4 by 2025 so that's quite a rise but as in most places, diabetes is more widespread amongst the immigrants into Norway than it is with the indigenous population. Now that is the same in the UK as well with the Afro-Caribbeans, etc., etc. So it tends to be uh, the indigenous population don't uh, suffer as much as uh, the immigrant population. So why does anyone want to become involved in diabetes, diabetes foot care? Because let me tell you, as a podiatrist, it can be very frustrating. It can be soul-destroying. Slight pun there, I don't know if that transfer. It can be a roller coaster of emotions because when you're dealing with a patient and taking them from a diagnosis of their first diabetic foot ulcer and taking them through the journey, it can be a huge roller coaster of emotions. It's also very hard work. Um, in talking to my new friends from Finland who... Uh, are working very hard there. They, they understand as clinicians and uh, managers, etc., that it's very hard work working with people with diabetes. And sometimes you can feel it pulling your hair out. And as you can see, I've been working with diabetic feet for a long time. Okay? 
Not as long as one of your later speakers, William, <laughs> but I have been working. So. On the other side, though, it's very, very satisfying working with people with diabetes. It's very rewarding. It is very challenging, but that's a good thing. You never, ever stop learning. And the most important thing, you can make a huge difference. There's a lot of medical interventions where you're working in other subjects that you, you think you're doing okay, but in diabetes you can make a real, real difference if you get it right. This is what every person in this room is trying to prevent. Whether you are working with preventative footwear, whether you're involved in screening a patient, whether you're involved in trying to manage their overall condition, uh, whatever aspect you're coming from, this is what we're trying to avoid. Every 30 seconds, a lower limb is lost somewhere in the world to diabetes. There's over a million amputations a year just due to diabetes. And up to 70% of all all leg amputations happen in patients with diabetes. This is probably the most important part of what I'm going to be, one of the most important parts of what I'm going to be talking about this morning. And this is from the International Diabetes Federation. In most cases, diabetic foot ulcers and amputations can be prevented. And it's estimated that up to 85% of amputations could be avoided if the correct systems were in place. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean, in 85% of the cases of somebody who ends up with, a, with an amputation, if you look back to all their treatment plan from the very start of their condition to when they ended up with the amputation, if things had been done slightly better at some point in that journey, they reckon 85% of these amputations could have been avoided. Now that means, were they screened properly? Were they educated properly? Did they have all the interventions? Did, when they were shown to be at risk, did, were they given proper footwear to prevent problems? And they reckon 85%, if everything was in place at the right time. Now that is why we're here today, because we're trying to make sure that each block of treatment is put in the place at the right time for that patient. And that's why we're all, all gathered here. This is something from the UK. More hospital beds are occupied with people with foot problems than with all the other complications that diabetes put together. So if you think of all the different complications that diabetes have, foot problems take up more bed days than all the other complications. It's a massive, massive economic as well as social problem. So, foot ulceration. 15% of your diabetes population will suffer from a foot ulcer in their lifetime. And about 5 to 7% of the diabetes population will be suffering from a foot ulcer at any one time. Splitting into three main categories, neuropathic, due to nerve damage, ischemic, due to interruption to the vascular supply, but the most common of all, that we're seeing these days are neuroischemic ulcers. So there is a neuropathic and an ischemic element to them. The life expectancy of somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer is worse than somebody with breast cancer or testicular cancer. If you were to have three people in a room, one with breast cancer, one with testicular cancer, and one with a diabetic foot ulcer, the person with the diabetic foot ulcer has less chance of being alive in five years' time than the people with the two cancers. We hear the word cancer and we go, hmm. We hear the word diabetic foot ulcer and we think, that's fine. Why would that be? Generally, when somebody has a diabetic foot ulcer, it means they're quite far down the path of their diabetes is really affecting their body systems. But could it be that we're getting much, much better at treating the cancers? We're identifying them, the screening processes, the education, the treatment, the early intervention are all in place better than we're dealing with the diabetic foot? Very possibly. So, what do podiatrists do? 
in diabetic foot care. We're involved in screening and assessment, debridement and treatment of ulcers. We liaise with all the different other um, professionals, like consultants, orthotists, GPs, specialist nurses, etc. We tend to coordinate the multidisciplinary team now. It used to always be the doctors who coordinated the team, but it tends now to be the podiatrist who's the centre of that team. We get involved with follow-up and we get involved with education. I'm not completely sure how you deliver your screening programmes in Norway, but these are different ways that we do them in Scotland and the rest of the UK. Some areas have introduced a training programme for other healthcare professionals apart from podiatrists to carry out screening. Some areas prefer just to have podiatrists carrying out all the foot screening. And some patients, some areas have twinned their retinal screening and their foot screening so that it's done at the same time, which can work very, very well. And some areas in Scotland use a combination of all of these. No doubt when I get to speak over the next couple of days to some of you, I'll be able to find out more exactly how these systems work in, in Norway. These are figures from an area in Scotland. And in 1995, there was this amount of podiatrists, not 6,000, but there was this amount of podiatrists to deal with 6,000 patients. Right up to 2010, there's virtually the same amount of podiatrists but look at the amount of patients. So that gap is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we have to think much more clever ways to make sure that the valuable podiatrist time is used where it's needed. Let's start with screening. Because I look upon any sort of screening program as the starting point of any good care that you're going to deliver. But to make it effective, it's got to be quick, it's got to be simple, and it's got to be able to be carried out by any of the healthcare professionals who are seeing the patient, not just the podiatrist. And most importantly, it's not just a data collecting exercise to say, ah, tick the box, you've, that patient has appeared for their screening. Yet again, I'm not sure completely how it works here, but in the United Kingdom, General practitioners and doctors get paid for recording the information that is collected during a screening. And it's really, it can just be like ticking a box. So we've got to move away from that. We've got to make sure a screening process is valuable. And that is to assess a patient's risk of developing a foot ulcer, which may lead to an amputation. And then arrange the appropriate treatment and education according to that risk level. Make sure that you have got a follow-up appointment according to that risk level. But remember, screening is very, a very, very basic task. It is not a difficult thing to do. Assessment is different. Screening is just front line, very start. So, what is the difference between screening and assessment? Screening detects early disease, whereas an assessment establishes a diagnosis. So in a screening process, you go, yeah, there's a problem. But if you're looking at a whole assessment, it's, you, you find out what has caused that problem, how it's going to impact and everything. Screening, you're only detecting there's a problem. Screening involves tests that have a predictive value and an agreed cutoff point where an assessment involves a whole lot of decision-making, which takes a lot more knowledge and competence to do. Screening should just require any healthcare worker who has the experience just to carry out a basic screening, whereas an assessment takes a healthcare professional, somebody with a lot more knowledge. Screening doesn't really require a treatment plan, but an assessment decides of the future treatment and whole management of the condition. Patients tend not to influence screening, but patients do influence the outcome of an assessment depending on their complete condition and their lifestyle and what they can manage. 
In Scotland, it's a continuous process, i.e. each patient should be screened once a year. But if you're involved in assessment or reassessment, it depends on your patient's response to you, the treatment. So screening once a year happens, do, do. but assessment or reassessment happens as often as the patient requires it, depending on their response to treatment. So what do we screen for when we're screening the diabetic foot? First thing we look for is any, any previous amputation. That's very obvious. And then we look at a significant structural abnormality, which we describe as a foot which can't fit into a shoe that can be bought in a high street shop and something that might need the expertise of a company like Clavinus, whether that is an off-the-shelf shoe or whether that is a bespoke shoe. We screen for active ulceration and we screen for previous ulceration. Previous ulceration is the biggest risk factor to future ulceration. Is the patient able to self-care? Can the patient get down to their feet? Can they see their feet so that they can check them, etc., etc.? We check for vascular insufficiency, and during the screening process, that is just palpating the pulses. We don't need Dopplers, we don't need any of this. It's basic screening. And if we can't feel the pulses, then we maybe send them for a more in depth assessment, which could use Dopplers and a bigger skill level, etc. And we screen for a neurological insufficiency, and we just use a monofilament in Scotland. It is cheap to use, simple to use, and it is easy to teach how to use. You can go to more in-depth things as part of an assessment, but as part of the basic screening, just a simple test. So, as I said, the purpose of screening is to assign a risk level. So what are the risk levels? Low medium, high, and active foot disease. But as I said early, our valuable podiatry resources should be kept for the people who are at risk of having an ulcer, i.e. the moderate, high, and active foot disease, and not used on the people who are at low risk. The people who are at low risk of ulceration have a 99.6% chance of being ulcer-free for two years. So they don't really have a much greater chance of developing a foot ulcer than somebody who does not have diabetes. So we shouldn't be putting huge amounts of resources towards that group. This is how we break down the, the groups. About 60% of your patients will fall into the low risk group. About 20% will fall into the moderate risk group. About 15 into the high risk group. And, as I said earlier, about 5% will have active foot disease at any one time. And this is what we've developed in Scotland to define this. It's a reasonably obvious traffic light system. But what this does is this defines what the risk is and what's caused the risk. And it also defines what that treatment regime the patient should receive. So this isn't just for clinicians, like all of us in here. This should be for patients to look at as well, and for the patient to leave the screening process knowing the risk and understanding the risk. And that's why it's been done in this simple way. So a low risk, no risk factors present. They've no neuropathy, they've no significant deformity, and they've got no vascular insufficiency. So what does that patient need? They need an annual screening by a healthcare professional, maybe not a podiatrist, and they need an emergency contact number in case there's a problem. Somebody who's at moderate risk has one risk value, i.e. neuropathy or ischemia, but without any other risk values, one risk value. So that patient should have an assessment by a podiatrist to assess what their needs are and they should have a treatment plan. Now, it might only be, they only might need to be seen once a year, but they might need to be seen quite a lot more, depending on the assessment. High-risk patient, it's like an accumulator. High-risk patient has one or more, uh, two or more risk values. So they might have neuropathy and a significant deformity and callus, whatever. And as I say, the top group is 
the people who have active foot disease, and they should be managed, if possible, within a multidisciplinary foot service. We have developed information leaflets in Scotland um, which correspond to the risk values so that you can give the appropriate information to your patients. I have given Roy um, electronic copies of these and if any of you are interested in using these, uh, it is our gift to you. <laughs> you would obviously need to translate them. In Scotland, we've translated them to five of the most common non-English languages uh, for any immigrant population. And um, we've also got uh, a leaflet on the Charcot, Charcot foot. So these are there if any of you would like them. We also produced a foot screening DVD, which I brought a couple of copies. I don't know how helpful this will be because it revolves around the system that we use for recording screening information and focuses on that. There's a couple of those here and um, those, uh, more of those could be got if you wanted that. And it's also available online. And we also have some of these which we put up in our clinics so that the patients understand about the screening process and what should happen. And they're all laminated so that they can be wiped in a clinic. So we have these resources. This is the screening form we use in Scotland. We're lucky to have this because this is an online system. And it, we, we do this on the computer and it is all linked throughout Scotland with the GP practices, the hospitals, etc, etc. And it automatically, when you put in the information, calculates the patient's risk for you. You don't need to think about the patient's risk. You put in the information, the system calculates it for you. This system at the moment isn't transferable outside Scotland, but we might sell it to you at some point. So, progress in Scotland. Uh, when I took over in 2007 as the national coordinator, um, we had about 25% of the patients were recorded on our screening system and uh, were given a risk value. By December 2010, we'd get up to 61%, but my target and the target set for me by the Scottish Government is 80% by the end of, or by April 2011. We're just about on target for that. So, I'm aware of the time. We were a bit late starting, so I, want to, I don't want to spend too long. So, after screening the patient, what must we do? We must put in place a treatment and management plan that suits that patient. It suits the risk and it suits the patient individually. Foot ulceration is a major predictor of lower limb amputation in patients with diabetes. They reckon about 80% of amputations are preceded by a foot ulcer. So if we can reduce the incidence of ulceration, we're obviously going to reduce the incidence of amputation. So if you discover a patient that has a foot ulcer, and if you can work within a multidisciplinary team, what does that multidisciplinary team do, or what should that multidisciplinary team do for that patient? First thing we've got to do is control the infection. Pressure relief is absolutely paramount. We've got to get involved in regular debridement, that's where the podiatrist comes in. Regular dressing changes and appropriate dressing changes, that could be the podiatrist, nurse or whoever else is dealing with it. There has to be appropriate referral. They might need the referral to the vascular surgeon to improve their circulation. They might need the orthotist for, to be put in a cast or an offloading device, etc, etc. And we have to educate that patient. Wound healing takes a lot of different aspects. And one of, the key as one of the key things is to make a proper assessment of that wound. What's caused it, what needs to be done, and all the elements that will take to heal that wound. I think it's like pulling all the pieces of a jigsaw together. 
where infection is the central piece of the jigsaw. Concentrate on that. Th always think infection. Pressure relief is, as I said, absolutely paramount. If you have an ulcer and you do not take the pressure off that, it will not heal. End of story. We've got to debride that ulcer. We've got to get rid of any of the slough, devitalized tissue, uh, any shards of bone, etc. That, that all has to be debrided. We've got to get involved in the dressings. I'm not going to talk much about that today because that is only a small piece of the healing jigsaw. And really all that dressing is there is to control the HD and manage the wound bed environment for that ulcer to have optimum chance of healing. You've got to pull all these pieces of that jigsaw together. If you have one piece of that jigsaw which isn't pulled together, that wound won't heal. You've got to have all the pieces pulled together and held together. In f the complication that patients fear most is amputation. And infection is often the final pathway that leads to this pre preventable event. But as I say, pressure relief is one of the most important aspects. And it is probably one of the aspects which is overlooked more than any other. And there's various things. Removable things like air cast, IPOS, uh, PRAFO, casts, all these sorts of things. And they serve to keep patients out of hospital. They reduce treatment costs. But most importantly, they improve the quality of life of the patient. If you can take the pressure off that, but let the patient still do, go about their daily life in some sort of fashion, then that will help their quality of life greatly. We must get involved in debridement, as I said, removing all the tissue. And that can be physical, which the podiatrists do, chemical, which I'm not too keen on. And we use quite a lot of maggot therapy in the, the UK larva therapy which is very efficient. Podiatrists do not make ulcers bigger. It's a myth. We take away all the callus and the unviable skin and the esca, and we expose the true ulcer size. An ulcer can be like an iceberg. You only see the tip. And you've got to take all the surrounding callus and devitalized tissue away. And some people think it makes it looking bigger, but it's actually just exposing the size of the ulcer. Because we've got to encourage good full depth healing. We say we've got to control the exudate, because if we control the exudate coming from the wound, then that helps to manage the wound environment to help heal it. Amputations are reduced if patients with diabetic foot problems are managed within a multidisciplinary foot service. And this was proved many years ago by our eminent next speaker, Dr. Mike Edmonds in 2001, who showed that you could reduce amputations by 40% if you involved a multidisciplinary team. So, if you discover active foot disease, you, if you have a multidisciplinary foot clinic, you should be picking the phone up and getting that patient to them as quickly as possible. Because every diabetic foot ulcer should be assessed by a podiatrist and hopefully as part of a multidisciplinary team. So who's in that multidisciplinary team? The patient, the podiatrist, the consultant, the orthotist, the tissue viability nurse, specialist nurse and district nurse. A dietitian, the vascular department, the orthopedic department, quite often a psychiatrist and a pharmacist. All those people aren't there at one time. Our definition of a multidisciplinary foot clinic in, in Scotland is the consultant, the podiatrist and the orthotist working together. And you maybe bring in these other elements when required. As I said, the podiatrist is the central piece of that clinic generally. The next most important person, I think, is the orthotist. The consultant is there to make my coffee. <laughs> I'm there to make the orthotist coffee. 
No, 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 no. We need the practice nurse and the district nurse. We need to be working with them as well to share care for the patient. And we need the diabetes specialist nurse because this foot is part of a person. And we don't just treat the foot, we treat the person. And it's the podiatrist's job to pull all that together and make sure that stays together and making sure the right people are working with the patient at the right time. So, it's the team approach. No single person can deal with a diabetic foot ulcer. We all have our own competencies, we all have our own skills, and we have work underway to define what these are at each stage of the diabetic foot disease process. So we must adopt this. Oh. So we're developing a competency framework, and it's based on clinical competency sets which underpin the theory and the educational components that are required for the clinician to be able to treat that patient effectively. What do you see here? What do you see? A painter? Is he doing a good job? He's doing all right. He knows he needs paint. He knows he needs a roller. Uh, and he's working away quite happily. And he's got a level of competence to do that. What do you see here? A painter, but maybe an artist. The only difference between the two is that person there has less of a competence and has less experience and less talent or less training than that person there. They're essentially doing the same job but they're doing it in a very different way. If you want to paint a wall, you need somebody with the competence of using a roller, but if you want a mural, you need somebody with a much higher competence and skill level. It's the same with the diabetic foot. You can screen somebody with a roller, <laughs> but if you want to treat somebody with a diabetic foot ulcer, you need a lot of other skills, and that is the same difference. It takes a minimal amount of skill to use a scalpel and debride some callus with probably an ulcer underlying that. It takes a bit more skill to deal with something like this. Because after a wee bit of scalpel work, that's a bit of debridement. But that's different from the first debridement, which was a bit of callus. It's the same thing, it's still debridement, but it takes a different skill level to do one to the other. And that can be gained through experience or knowledge or education. And then we work through the process here. Not all patients are as happy as this one. What did we need to do? We needed to control the infection. We needed to improve the circulation. We needed to get a good debridement, good wound healing skills, and pressure relief. And because all those pieces came together, we ended up with it healed. Had one of those elements not been in place, that would have ended up probably a, a baloney amputation. You need all the pieces of the jigsaw. Pressure relief, as we say, we need the difference between trauma shoes, we need four foot pressure relief shoes, we need heel pressure relief devices, all these things we need as a part of our armory to treat the patient. It's best to keep patients out of hospital, it saves money, but more importantly, patients don't like being in hospital. We've got to think about quality of life. It's not always what you put on a diabetic foot ulcer that heals it. It's what you take off it. People think, what is the, the magic dressing that I can put on that is going to heal that ulcer? That dressing is only that amount. It's what you take off it. You've got to take the infection 
away, you've got to take the pressure away and you've got to take all the devitalised tissue away. What you put on it is a wee piece of the jigsaw. So just remember, when you see a diabetic foot ulcer, don't think, what am I going to put on it to heal it? Think, what am I going to take off it? And that will sort your mind out. We've got to educate our patients. These can be helpful. We've got to educate the patients to check their feet daily, to wash them daily, especially before they come to see the podiatrist. <laughs> Apply cream as often as required and be very careful with new shoes. We've got to give them the appropriate advice. When I say apply cream as often as required, it's, we've got to make sure we give the patients the right information. There's no point in saying to the patient, put cream on your feet each day without telling them not to put it between their toes. So you're giving the same information, but you're giving them the proper information. If they put cream between their toes, it will macerate and could cause an ulcer. So yes, give the information, but make sure it's the right information. Education for us clinicians. Always check both feet. If somebody comes to see you, make sure you, you strip off the other foot as well. Because you've got to be able to check the comparison for heat, for any sort of swelling, any redness, and you can't do that in isolation. Of our amputated patients, you've got to. But for the ones who have not had an amputation, make sure you look at both feet. A, the patient might not know that they've got a problem on their other foot, and only know they've got, but it's very good for a comparison. As I say, for heat, swelling, redness, and all these things. Dressings, I'm not going to get involved in. These are some of the dressings I use, uh, and uh, I think it is a small part of the treatment. It's not as important as people make out. We've got to make sure when we've got an ulcer healed that we prevent it breaking down again. And that is where it is very important with education and especially with companies like Clavinus who can put in preventative measures with footwear that the patients want to and don't mind wearing. And that is very, very important. And I know Roy spoke about that earlier, but I know I've got a lot of patients or I've had a lot of patients in the past who have been supplied with shoes and they just don't wear them. And that's pointless for everybody. We've got to detect problems early. That is why we screen our patients. We've got to make an accurate diagnosis. We've got to be effective in the treatment that we do. And we've got to make sure that we refer on when required. We've got to get to know all our other healthcare professionals so that we can talk to them and get to know people that we need to involve at the time, that the patient needs it. Don't lose your patients to follow up. Don't treat them and then let them go because they'll come back and haunt you unless you check them. Our patients, when we supply them footwear, we bring them back and we repair all the footwear and we check them and we check the insoles and it keeps a tab on the patient. Don't just supply them and then next patient, next patient. Keep seeing them because if you don't, they'll come back with a problem. We must all communicate. Both podiatrists with other healthcare professionals and vice versa. And we must be aware that each of our individual professions has their own skill set. And we must embrace our fellow professionals and say, do you know, I'm not as good at doing that as the orthotist. The orthotist sometimes isn't as good at using a scalpel as the podiatrist. And we've got to accept that. But we've got to embrace our, all the professions so that we work together. Because remember, no one profession will be able to heal an ulcer. It takes the team. Thank you for listening.